Hey librarians, this video is for you. I'm going to do a review of the tool called LibWizard, which is created by SpringShare. LibWizard is an interactive kind of do-it-all tool which you can use for tutorials, quizzes, surveys, uh, things like that. And it'll actually collect information with you because it is a cloud-based tool. And it'll even generate a certificate of completion for students. So you probably know SpringShare already from being the maker of LibGuides. So one of the perks of adding on LibWizard to your SpringShare Spring subscription is that it does live with your LibGuides. It does make embedding LibGuides very easy. Um, this is a really neat tool whenever you are trying to attach a tutorial that'll walk a user through a web page, information literacy, anybody, or maybe learning to use a library web page. So let's go ahead and dive in, I'll show you what it can do. And I'll show you the back end as well. And I'll also talk a little bit about what I like about it and why I don't like about it. So let's dive in. All right, so right here in front of me, I have um, just a quick demo tutorial I created. This isn't library focused, I'm sorry. This is web accessibility from this, this favorite website of mine, WebAIM. But you get the gist here of what LibWizard looks like. It always has this format. It has the uh, content you create on the left and the right two thirds here is an embedded web page. And there's different things you can do. It doesn't have to be an embedded web page. You can put other content here, but generally LibWizard has this um, layout, kind of the one third of your stuff and then two thirds of whatever other visual content you want to present. So here I have a tutorial where I'm asking users to read through this informational web page from WebAIM on web accessibility. So on the right hand side, they can scroll through it. On the left, there's an introduction and it tells them what to do. Read through this informational page, then answer the questions that follow. Navigation is really simple. They can just click next and back. You can embed questions, uh, multiple choice questions, there's a wide variety of different kinds of questions. I tend to be partial as an instructional designer to, to multiple choice questions with only one answer because they are extremely straightforward and easiest to use for most people. And they also tend to be the most accessible as well. You can collapse or expand this as you just saw, you can click on the, the menu here. Again, this is a very simple tutorial demo that I threw together, it only has the, the one section here. But you can see you can click through the questions here. Theoretically, you know, you've already read through this um, whole page. And I did add a drop down question as well. What are the four categories of disabilities? You can answer that right or wrong. Hit submit. Ta-da! I got a certificate of completion. You can see <laughs> apparently I got both questions wrong, which is fantastic. Um, but one of the nice things about this is that if you were using this for, uh, say, if you're an academic librarian using this for a class, uh, you could give this tutorial link to a faculty, an instructor, have them assign it to their students, and then the students could prove that they did it and got whatever score is required by the instructor or by the librarian by turning in the certificate to class. Because you can print this, you can um, save this as PDF, and you could upload it to the learning management system, or the students could, I should say, if you had a library assignment that you worked with the faculty to put into their class. So that's pretty cool. So this is a pretty simple example um, using a static web page. I got one more here just to show you some of the limitations of embedding web pages. So sometimes there's an issue with the embedded web page. This is really, I've seen this most commonly used for embedding a web page and then, you know, having students do stuff on that web page. You'll see this blue box up here, which is a default. Obviously, this is here because sometimes it's an issue that the web page does not display below, so you can have them open it up in a new window. But of course, then one of the challenges is that they're clicking back and forth between this and this and then this and then this, <laughs> that's not the best experience. And already this kind of split screen thing you have with um, the one third, two third thing doesn't always work so great. Let me go ahead and reload this. So this website did load, but let me show you here. This is, um, th this is meant for teaching users to use this tool to evaluate websites. So you're supposed to put in a web address. I'm gonna use ASU library web page here, hit enter. Sometimes this doesn't load, but you can see this gets this gets really wonky. So sometimes 
it seems like the website is fine, but then you can see you're not actually able to use this full tool. You'd have to open it up in a new window. And again, that's a that's a whole thing. So I just wanted to make you aware of that. You know, if you've got static content, like a PDF or something, that's going to display just fine here. Images will display fine. You can put in tutorial videos from like YouTube or, or your own uh, creations, and those will embed just fine there. But sometimes the websites get weird. Another downside is that... um. If you are trying to put in a, like I say, a database page uh, where usually users have to log in because they're affiliated with your institution, so it's password protected. Um, if it's accessed via a proxy, that's also really difficult to set up with LibWizard. I haven't had to do it myself, but I have a, on good authority from a library that did spend several months trying to get a proxied website and proxied resources working with LibWizard that it was a huge hassle. It works now, but they still have some issues with when they pass out the links. It depends uh, if you're on campus or off campus at this particular university, how well, um, how quickly they're able to access the resource and what link you need to give them. Be a different link for on campus versus off campus campus. It's a whole thing. That's just something for you to be aware of that I wanted to share. So now I'll go ahead and um, show you the back end of this. So this is the web accessibility tutorial demo that I showed you. Again, this is just a demo. It's very simple, but this is your landing page for a tutorial. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and say it right now. It's not intuitive. <laughs> it's not intuitive. I've, I've been fortunate to use some really Intuitive, wonderful e-learning authoring tools. I would not count LibWizard among them. Again, it's nice that it lives with um, your other spring share products like LibGuides. You can embed a LibGuide really easily. You can just boop, pop this in here uh, and you can go through and choose what LibGuide you want to put in. Again, I told you, you can put in images, PDFs, embedded media. For what it does, it has, it has a purpose and it does it pretty well. There is a learning curve though to figuring out how exactly this whole thing is supposed to work. So you can see it's kind of bracketed here by the welcome screen and the certificate of completion. You saw my certificate of completion when I um, went through that multiple choice quiz. In between, it calls them slides and then it gets a little bit more muddled because within the slide, it's called the slide work pad, uh, there's slide content and these, these kind of like look the same. So it's like slides within slides. It took me a while to kind of figure this out. So this is where it gets a little bit less intuitive here. Um, putting in a text block is pretty straightforward, right? So that first one here is, um, let me just go ahead and reload this. Uh, my first text block is this right here, okay? So WebAIM is a wonderful resource for web accessibility. You can see I can edit this. WebAIM is a wonderful resource for web accessibility. So you can see that's just text. That makes sense. I decided I wanted to add on two multiple choice questions. So then you have to add in um, navigation buttons to separate it if you want that nice separation. Again, you click next, you see a question. Next, you see another question. So you can drag and drop the questions in. It labels them all as multiple choice. I consider radio buttons to really be the only like true multiple choice. That tends to be my favorite. Um, that's the round buttons. Radio buttons, you can only choose one. Um, so again, not, not super intuitive. Uh, radio button means you can choose one. I haven't gotten to the settings. Possibly you could choose two, but best practice is one answer. Okay, I'm an instructional designer. Let me tell you, best practice, one answer for multiple choice question. I can drag those in. And then if you want those buttons in between, I've already forgotten what it's called. It's called the question page break. See this little lightning bolt, the little lightning bolt right here. At least that's one thing that this does well is you can match up the icons, try to remember what these different things are. So you can see the radio icon button here. That's a radio, uh, what is this, a menu? This looks like a menu button to me, but it's the drop down here. So you can kind of match those up. Not super intuitive. Um, there are a lot of opportunities to customize your content though. So say for this multiple choice question here is a short name. There's a question text, um, true or false. Oh, you have to select the, <laughs> the answer here. Uh, you have to, it's not a default. Um, you have to make sure you choose which one is correct. And again, this is not intuitive. It doesn't say what this checkbox is for. This is default choice, yeah, not intuitive. Um, but there are uh, other options here. You can make sure it's required. So if you're using this as an assignment, you might wanna make the quiz questions required so the students, the learners are forced to go through them. You can choose some of the properties for the answers. You can customize your right or wrong um, messages. I'm a big 
fan of effective feedback. Feedback is essential to learning. Give feedback and decide if you want correct answer to continue. I really frown on the correct answer to continue. This can get really frustrating, especially if a poorly written question. I've gotten stuck in too many questions <laughs> to be forced to stick with a requiring the correct answer. I don't recommend that one. Um, and then it gets more complicated from there. If you are sending this out to be used in another class, you can add a quiz question uh, with a um, text area input where you ask the learners to put in maybe their name and maybe their faculty name so you can see where they're coming from or maybe their class number. And then you can go into the dashboard for this, but it will collect information not only how each student did on the quiz, but it'll collect the information they put in. So their name, their faculty name. So for statistics, this really can't be beat. It's an all-in-one. It's not like um, Storyline or Rise, if you're familiar with those, where you have to package up the e-learning and put it into a learning management system to track information. This is a cloud-based product. It's all-in-one. So any of these tutorials you put out into the world, the things I'm answering on this will be tracked. If I put my name into this and my faculty's name and my class name, that would be tracked. Something else it does really nice too is it uh, collects the referring URL so you know where your users are coming from. So if you end up having people from like other colleges or universities or libraries send their students to do your tutorial, you'll be able to track that down. That's pretty cool, right? So this is a really um, library focused product that addresses some of the challenges that librarians in specific have, like the ability to track, right? That's really difficult. You do have to add your own boxes, again, to collect the name, to collect the faculty, the class number, and hope that your learners fill those out. Those would probably be a good one to make required, uh, but that does help you see for your own you know, information literacy statistics, who is actually completing these things, what faculty are completing them, and then you'll be able to reach out to those faculty. So that's really nice. So while I do criticize this non-intuitive interface, it's just that <laughs> I don't really appreciate. It. Oh, I can show you view reports here. Um, I do really appreciate its use in the world of libraries as far as being an all in one product that does track that is super, super helpful for libraries. So I can show you the report for this. Um, I did a real quick, um, you know, testing of my own product here. You can see how I answered these questions. You can see who referred me. I went straight to the link. You can see what browser I'm using. So if you have a lot of people reporting an issue, for example, with your tutorial, you can go and check and see uh, maybe what browser tends to be having issues. So that's pretty cool. If you have a lot of people using a non-traditional browser that you're not familiar with, that would also be really cool. All right, so that's basically the whole demo. It works. It's not super intuitive. It works. It is very customizable. What I would probably do is build out a tutorial that has the look and feel you kind of want and probably just like try to reuse that tutorial, do like a, a duplication and use that tutorial over and over. Um, it is really valuable that this is a tutorial that can live on the same page as a web resource. You can also add your own things. You can have additional slides where maybe the first one is a web page, the next one's a video, the next one after that is a PDF. Maybe they download the PDF as a handout. That would be pretty cool. It does live with your LibGuide and bundle with your existing SpringShare subscription, so that can be really ha uh, helpful for that all-in-one billing. You know, there are challenges to this. It does have an unintuitive interface. It is difficult to set up proxied resources, so that's something you'll be doing a lot of. That's gonna be a challenge. Um, and I'll just add, if you are having students work through like a database page doing searches like practice searches for information literacy for class assignments and then you're having them answer questions based on the results they get as those databases are updated your questions are going to stay the same so you'll find out pretty quickly that the questions are going to be answered incorrectly or the students won't be able to answer the questions because it's based on that live content and that live content is changing. So just keep that in mind. Uh, one way around that is you can do a screenshot of a website or a screenshot of um, database search results and then that would be a static page that would always stay the same and get students answer questions based on that. Um, talk to me if you want some more advice and I've got a lot of opinions on how to write effective uh, questions like that. Uh, again, these tutorials, it does suffer from this split attention effect. I'll show you again what I mean. Um, there's something called uh, the split attention effect in educational psychology. It's where you have to look at one thing and then another thing and your eyeballs are just like bouncing back and forth like a ping pong ball. This is a big challenge where I cue the question and then I'm like, oh, 
Um, trying to look through this. What's the question again? Oh, okay. I'm trying to look through this. What's the question again? You just like keep going back and forth or maybe some information here telling you what to look for in this page. And I keep having to go back and forth. That taxes a user's cognitive load, okay? It's extraneous cognitive load. There's only so much, you know, cognitive capacity for any given learning task. And if you're having the learner have to go back and forth between these things, that's going to be a big challenge. So in the past, that's why I've been a big fan of things like Storyline instead, because you can simulate the web experience and it's all on one page, rather than having this like split attention effect. So you can have one column versus these two columns. You know, that's not a deal breaker necessarily, but I want you to be aware of it. The more complex information or questions you have over here, the more complex this information is, the harder it is for your user to go back and forth. Um, I also have some concerns about the accessibility of LibWizard. Um, for this product, a lot of, almost all of the help information is behind a paywall. Um, this wouldn't really, this isn't a product that's going to be accessible for like, you know, keyboard users, screen reader users. It's going to be very difficult for anyone with a disability that uses the keyboard or a screen reader to, or screen reader to navigate through. Again, that's partly because of that, that split attention thing where you've got content on the left, you've got content on the right, and how are they supposed to be going back and forth between that? They're not, it's just going to work, not going to work. So that's just something to keep in mind. Uh, that's basically it for my review. If you have any questions or comments, put them into the comments below and I will take a look at those and answer those. You can also reach out. I've got a lot of opinions about this software, so I'm always happy to chat. Um, I hope this was helpful and um, I hope you're able to better inform your choice of uh, tutorial software going forward.